think we're ready to go on that. So um, thanks everyone, obviously, for attending um, our webinar today. So we have decided to run the um, dietitian and the podiatry webinar together. Um, obviously, the disciplines are you know, vastly different, but in the context of recruitment um, and the recruitment sort of journey side of it, I'll, there's a lot of crossover and, and commonalities in between them all. Um, so um, we've decided just to run it together. There'll be a few different points that we'll highlight to you along the way and um, that you, you, you'll need to know along, you know, within the process itself. And um, so what I'll do firstly is I general sort of housekeeping rules here. And um, so all cameras um, automatically turned off and mics are muted on entry to the webinar. If you have any questions throughout, if you could um, just enter them into the chat function. And what I'll do is I'll try and, um, you know, revert back to them as much as possible throughout. Um, and we can answer any queries with there'll be a couple of stages along the way. I'll pause for questions as well. And um, so it'll be a good chance for you to be able to um, have a bit of an input if you like. And um, the webinars are recorded also and solely for the purpose of training purposes as well. But there's a lot of your, I suppose, fellow students or fellow classmates that are on placements as well. So that's going to be circulated to everyone. What we do is we put it up live and um, I'll show you where to find that on our career hub um, and you can access that information whenever you like. And um, so what we have here is just a general of the people involved in today. Myself, my name is Connor Shanley and I'm working for the Recruitment, Reform and Resourcing program. And um, my colleague Francis is doing admin in on the background as well. Um, and we have two guest speakers today as well, Caroline McCusker and Ruth Kilcoley. Um, and what I would do, I think Caroline is running a bit late at the minute, so I'm just going to um, invite Ruth, um, I suppose, to join us just for a minute and uh, discuss um, I suppose just her role and her and her career to date as well. Hi, Ruth. Hello. How are you? Very well. Um, so, if you'd like, I suppose just to discuss, I suppose Ruth, I suppose your career and I suppose where where you started off and I suppose where you are now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Um. Um. Yeah. So, um, welcome everyone here today, and um, it's it's great to um to have uh, future dietitians in the room because uh, I'm a dietitian myself and um, I qualified through DIT in Kevin Street um, back in 2001 and I um, started my first job as a staff grade dietitian um, at the time the recruitment process was very different Connor because I started three days after my final exam um, oh God, a lot different song. <laughs> which was uh, kind of straight into it in Galway University Hospital as um, um, at a locum cover staff grade dietitian at the time. Um, things are a bit different now, um, but um, the manager at the time was very quick off the blocks. Um, and I did a year at that stage in Galway University Hospital where I did a rotation across the different clinical specialties within the hospital um, as a staff grade dietitian, which gave me a great oversight of, of, of acute care. Um, I then moved on to uh, work in industry for a number of years with a nutrition to a nutrition uh, company that did enteral feeding. And um, so again, I learned a lot about um, the community side of, of nutrition and dietetics in through that role. Um, I worked a lot with nursing homes and elderly people, public health nursing and, and that, that wider community based disciplinary team. I went on from there then to work in primary care um, and I did uh, uh, run a number of clinics in primary care uh, for people with chronic disease, obesity, diabetes um, for a, a number of years in Galway and Mayo. Um, I moved from there then into child and adolescent mental health, where I was the uh, first dietitian in Ireland working in that, that sector. And that role was both inpatient in an inpatient psychiatric unit and outpatient in child and adolescent mental health um, teams across Galway, Mayo and Roscommon. And um, the predominant nature of my work in that role was in the nutritional assessment and management of patients with eating disorders um, and I worked there for a number of years um, and I focused a lot at that stage um, in a senior grade at um, some more service development um, activities around clinic management and um, reporting on um, uh, different clinical conditions and their management on, on, on a more of a national scale. Um, we moved on from there then to back to GUH and in, back into the clinical setting again of where I worked in oncology 
um, as a senior dietitian um, and again focusing on the nutritional assessment and management of patients with um, different forms of cancer at different stages of their, um, their journey. Um, and uh, that role was uh, very interesting from the point of view of learning more about multidisciplinary work and um, I suppose the importance of nutritional interventions at different stages of treatment for people uh, with cancer um, and the different nature of treatment delivery, both inpatient and outpatient. And, and so I, I learned a lot. Um, when I was in that role, I also was lucky enough to um, become more involved in quality improvement projects and trying to improve processes of nutritional uh, care delivery in the hospital, particularly around malnutrition screening. Um, and the, the identification and management of malnutrition uh, across um, hospital setting. Um, and then um, I moved from there then out of dietetics um, a number of years ago into a quality management job in stem cell transplants and then finally or so far to here in the National HSCP office where I uh, work um, uh, for the benefit of HSCPs across all 26 professions and uh, most of my work is focused on integrating HSCPs into the design and the delivery of healthcare services within the HSE. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, yeah. And I suppose your career as well, it's a good to have an insight into, I suppose, the, you know, how I suppose your career has, to, you know, there's there's so many different pathways available. Um, I mean, we've a lot of people in different professions that can, you know, that they can expand on, I suppose, their skill set and that they can bring that into, I suppose, a national sphere as well, which is all always good. So thanks very much for for speaking to us about that, Ruth. Uh, we have Caroline here as well. Um, Caroline is a podiatrist as well. How are you, Caroline? Hello, Connor, and hello, everyone. Um, How are you? So um, would you like to talk a bit, I suppose, about podiatry in your career, Caroline? Yes, so podiatry in the HSC is relatively new in the sense back in 2011, there was only 11 employed podiatrists within the HSC. Um, so when I started out, I actually studied in the University of Salford in Manchester. And um, when I graduated, I came to Dublin looking um, for jobs. So I ended up, I was in private practice but the private practice then um, had an agreement with St. Colum Kills Hospital in Dublin for me to go in and provide diabetes um, care to patients. So when that went on, so I was part time in the hospital and then part time doing private work. And that evolved then when St. Vincent's Hospital, who would be a sister hospital of um, uh, St. Colum Kills, they got funding through the National Clinical Programme for Diabetes. And um, there was posts then released. So I had applied for one of these posts and um, I got a senior post as um, a diabetes podiatrist. So it was split between Vincent's and um, some column kills, providing active fit care um, for patients. Um, and in that role, there was me and another podiatrist and we had to build the service from scratch. Um, which was very interesting. There was a lot of challenges along the way from simple things like our documentation um, right through to the triage and, and educating then our colleagues in exactly the role of a podiatrist. So I stayed there um, for six or seven years and then um, I moved across into um, the RCSI hospital group and I was in um, the Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital and um, Louth County. And there again, I was in a role as a senior podiatrist, providing um, care again to diabetes cohort, because at that time, that was the only funding stream. So up until the new ECC model, the community health care network model, um, podiatry was predominantly um, 80 to 90 percent diabetes only. Um, so in that role, then we grew the service. So it started with me and another podiatrist. And by the time I was leaving, there was five of a team, which was fantastic. And um, we built the uh, relationships with community podiatry as well. And in 2019, then I went into management. So I was over um, CHO1, which is Sligo, Leitrim, Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. 
And that role seen me stepping back from the clinical aspect because at that time there was only three other managers in the HSC for podiatry. So we had to start from scratch with our documentation, our policies, procedures, um, and try to bring everyone into line. So even though we were one CHO, um, every county operated very differently. And that team in the time that I was there grew from 12 to 33 podiatrists. So that was excellent. And we've seen then the rollout of the chronic disease um, hubs and um, also of the community health networks. And then last year, um, I am now the podiatry manager across um, Cavan and Monaghan. Um, and we're looking at then the new realignment um, of the HSC, which will bring us over to Louth and Meath and North Dublin. So there's lots of change and um, there's great opportunity for podiatry at the minute. Um, a lot of um, in 2020, we got 96 podiatry posts for the Community Health Network, which is specific to non-diabetes. And um, so it definitely is a thriving profession. Um, we're in our infancy stages, um, but it definitely is, um, it's improving. We've got more podiatry managers and we have also then got our career uh, pathway progression from a staff grade to a senior into the clinical specialist then as well, Connor. That is fantastic. Thanks so much, Caroline, for, for, for talking us through that as well. Um, so what I'll do now, you can mute and turn off your camera, Caroline, and I will I'll conduct, I suppose, the um, the start, I suppose, of the webinar and our areas of discussion. Um, so what we hope, I obviously today, what we aim to do is we're going to discuss a career within the HSE. Uh, we're going to discuss a platform available to everyone, um, every member of the public, um, and especially it sort of caters, um, I suppose, for students and people who are unfamiliar in how to sort of apply for HSE roles. Um, and then we're going to discuss the national campaigns. So our national campaign for dietitians is um, currently underway. Um, and podiatry then it ran last year towards the end of May. So we're going to be given a similar enough time frame um, for the national campaign for podiatry. So it should be running um, next month. Um, but again, the information is very, very similar across both. Um, we'll discuss them and then we're going to discuss, I suppose, you know, applying for the roles and I suppose interview stage and how to sort of prep for interviews. And um, we have a couple of tips and pointers in there and we have a few modules available for you to, I suppose, reflect on as well. Um, and then we'll discuss, I suppose, panels, what happens after the interview? Um, once you're placed on a panel, what happens? And I suppose, what do you need to do yourselves um, when on this panel? Um, and that is basically what we'll aim to do. Um, so we'll carry on, I suppose, with a general sort of overview. I suppose the HSE, we've 130,000 employees within the HSE. Um, it's the largest employer in the state. Um, we have so many different services and it's it's a very complex service, but we've so much going on in every single county, I suppose, in the country. Um, a member of the team, I suppose, we, there's opportunities for funding for continuous professional development with generous annual leave, public holiday entitlements. We permanent contracts available as well of employment um, for all health and social care professionals, I suppose, graduates that are coming into the HSE and obviously the pension, obviously, which is very attractive um, a public service pension. Um, so our aim, I suppose, within these webinars, we want to obviously you know, welcome, I suppose, as many graduates as possible to the HSE to try and, you know, en encourage you to, and create awareness about what the HSC offers and, and what is available to you um, as a new graduate and hopefully a new employee within the HSC. Um, so overall, if you want to, I suppose, start your career as a dietitian or podiatrist, what you'll need is your relevant educational requirements. So you're all obviously in your final year or so of your studies. Um, once you not graduate, once you get your results and you pass your, your course, that is essentially what you'll need. It's your first step within the HSE to work within your discipline. Um, then you will need to obviously get professional registration with CORU. So they're the relevant regulatory body who cover all health and social care professionals, well, most of them, um, but including dietitian and podiatry. And you will need to have your registration approved by CORU before you start to work as a dietitian or a podiatrist. Um, and I'll go over CORU um, a bit more um, in a couple of minutes as well, just to familiarize yourself with that process because it is very important and um, it's one of the things you should definitely take from today is that the necessity to I suppose apply to Coru straight away and um, and then there's various different continuous professional development initiatives involved we've um, a lot of different resources available for you to progress once you're within the HSE so there's always things in the background for you to do 
So the core registration piece is again, once you've passed your course, so in May, whenever you do your exam result and you get your results, so whether it be May at the end of May or June, you will officially now be able to submit um, documents to Coru. And what this means is that if you visit um, Coru, um, uh, uh, just Google search Coru and the documents that you need, you need transcripts of your studies, you need, I suppose, identification. And um, there's a couple of different details that you need to submit to Coru. And with Coru, it works in sort of in, in two different methods. Once you send in all your documentation, I suppose within a couple of weeks, you will get an email from Coru that will say your application is either complete or incomplete. If it's incomplete, they'll request further documents you may have forgot or that they may need. And um, if it is complete at that stage only, your work is done. You can't do any more and it will move on to, I suppose, the Coru um, regulatory they do a review board once a month. So they meet once a month to go over the applications and then they will obviously approve and register people as you know, as the documents provide themselves. So it's very important for you to get all your documents together and get them sent in as you know as quickly as possible because it can take I suppose we were in conversation with Coru a lot and these time frames have you know decreased um you know over the last number of years so on average I suppose the timeline it's it's about 4.6 weeks but it can take anywhere from four to six to four to seven weeks for that whole thing to process so I mean it's very important that you get your everything sorted and your documentation very early on um, and this will have <coughs> major relevance I suppose which I'll discuss further on is that when you apply for your national campaign or apply for jobs within the HSC we will bring you along the recruitment journey in that you know if you're eligible we'll bring you on to your interview you will interview and place on a panel then if successful and without your core registration you sit on that panel as uh, there's two statuses on a panel you're either active and can get job offers or you're dormant and you don't receive them so what happens is if you are second on the panel, you will sit there waiting until your core registration comes in. You will send that registration number and proof of registration to whoever the recruitment contact is that you've been dealing with with emails about the campaign and they will change your status. And only at that point you will start receiving job offers or expressions of interest. So it's very, very important that you get that core registration sorted as quick as possible because only at that point once you're made active you will receive job off job offers so if you sit on it for three four five months and you're delaying you're not going to get any progress I suppose with the career or with the job opportunity either so it's just essential that that element is satisfied so make sure just to remember to do that I suppose as quickly as possible um, the career within the HSE, the HSE overall then manages services through a structure designed to put patients and clients at the centre of the organisation. We're currently transitioning, I suppose, um, into regional health areas. So we have six regional health areas for the country. And I suppose this year we're transitioning fully into that. Um, and again, I highlight various areas like the disability services, um, you know, that the there's significant importance around them at the minute. We have a lot of focus on the disability services because they're such an essential part and such an important element of the HSE as well. Um, and again, all services, again, we're recruiting all health and social care professionals and it can be an excellent and rewarding career path for graduates. Um, again, we have our diversity and inclusion piece as well. Um, our core values, care, compassion, trust and learning. Again, you will receive these slides and you can review them at, at your own leisure as well. Um, just a quick one on we conduct surveys every two years within the HSE staff surveys. So we conduct them. Um, our last one was last year in 2023. And the overall aim of it is to, I suppose, create awareness, I suppose, to ourselves of what is working and what we need to do and what we need to focus more on. Um, so you can see from our chart here, we've highlighted a few different areas. Um, so the green um, columns are 2021 um, and the yellow being 2023. So we've seen significant improvements from a staff perspective or staff opinion perspective um, over the last, you know, over the last number of years um, in various different areas. Um, I suppose staff are feeling more supported and are feeling that their, you know, their voice has been heard, um, you know, within um, their line management and they're feeling overall um, you know, more satisfied with the job as we conduct these surveys. So these results based, whatever these results of the survey yields to us, we're able to, I suppose, start various different initiatives and action plans based on them. So it's just a thing that you should always know what's going on in the background. Um, and we're always aiming to obviously improve every factor of it. Um, and even seeing significant improvement for us is 
it's great to see it, but it doesn't mean that our, our work or our duties are done behind the scenes. It's something that we constantly are aiming to to obviously maintain it first and foremost, but but improve as well over time. And um, I ha have slides on that for your for yourself to review at a later date. And it basically goes into a lot more of the volume of information and I suppose the general improvements that we have seen. Um, and again, we have um, a platform called HSE Land, which once you join the HSE, you will be familiar with. Um, and on that has a lot of different modules and stuff for training and development. And um, it's good to highlight that at this point so that you know that there is, you know, a lot of this. There is a lot of online learning, a lot of online courses that you can do within the HSE. Um, and a lot of them are available there. Um, and once you start work, they, they'll be highlighted to you and you can obviously do them within your first couple of weeks or through your induction period. Um, so this moves us on to Career Hub and this element will be very important, I suppose, to yourselves. Um, we started the Career Hub last April and the Career Hub is sort of has two functions that concern us at the minute. So the main one is that Career Hub, there's a QR code there you can scan with your phone and um, it will bring you to a portal and allow you to register your name and your email address and it will allow you highlight your preferred discipline and your preferred location of work. So you can put in a uh, podiatrist Limerick and what happens then on a weekly basis, we will um, go through, I suppose, the jobs that are available and anything that matches your preference, we will send you an email and we do that on a weekly basis. And what that does, it, it just it takes a bit of the hassle off you constantly searching through, you know, different job sites, the HSE website and all these different areas. Um, and it just consolidates everything into a week. Um, some weeks you may get an email saying, you know, there, there has been no matches to your searches. Some weeks you may get saying there's three or four matches. So it, it's a very good thing for you to be able to um, to join and register with. Um, and on Career Hub as well, we have all recordings from webinars I've done previously for other disciplines are available on it. But also there is a lot of modules available for preparation work, for applications and for interview. There's videos to watch. There's various different um, generic sort of style um, questions or areas for consideration for interviews. Um, and I can help really, you know, I can help you gain focus, I suppose, when you're prepping for an interview um, because the interviews, I suppose, for the HSE, they're they're a bit different in structure wise compared to, you know, the private sector or other organizations, um, which I'll go through as well with, you know. Um, so what we'll do now, there's obviously the other candidate support information on Career Hub and there's various different information and documents about what to expect through this journey. Um, so for I'll just highlight here to you as well. So our national campaign for dietitians is currently live and um, it launched um, last week, I think last Tuesday, and it's going to close um, this day, two weeks, I believe. Um, uh, the podiatry one is. Again, still not confirmed the date, but it ran last year in May and we fully expect it to run um, again in May this year. Um, again, when that is due to go live, we will email, I suppose, career officers and, um, you know, within your colleges and they'll distribute that information for you. But if you register on Career Hub, put your preference in as podiatry and wh whatever county you put it in, when, it, when the national campaign comes up, you'll get an email and an alert about it. So that'll just highlight that for you. Um, the panel here that I've referenced, yeah, so the dietitian interviews are likely to take place mid-June. And the panel will go live once the results are all correlated and brought together. The panel will go live then in July. Um, and again, similar enough to podiatry, if this is advertised in May, because the, it might not be as high of a volume as dietitians, it'll run a small bit quicker. So you will probably look at the same sort of context that you podiatry will go live or advertise in May. Interviews most likely will be around June as well with July when the panel goes live. Um, so that's just the function there as well. You can go out to the hse.e website for the dietitian national campaign and just type in your NRS 14227 and that will bring you towards all the documentation that you'll need um, for preparation for it. So the first thing I'll say is once once you are presented with any job within the HSE, you're first met once you go on to the link and you can see the role you're met. You have three documents. You have your job specification, your additional campaign information and your application form. Um, and we'll discuss the job specification briefly first. Um, this is a very, very important document in that it highlights all the duties, the responsibilities, location, a post, um, competencies that you will be interviewed on. And it has all the information that you will need to successfully, I suppose, undertake the role or it'll highlight the duties that are essential within it. Uh, you can see the dietitian one on the left. I have a just have it on a bigger screen here. 
Our dietitian on the left is the current live one. And our um, chiropodist or podiatrist staff grade one on the right is last year's campaign. You can see basically from the layout, they're very, very similar. Um, they discuss details of service um, and report and relationships and different areas. And it's always good for you to read that and gain a knowledge of you know, the role itself and what's expected. Um, in some instances, like on the right, we've informal inquiries and we have people's, you know, people's names that you can contact to discuss the roles or opportunities. Um, they may appear for some the national campaigns like dietitians because it's such a large campaign. We don't specifically highlight one particular person. Um, and for the podiatrist one, there is a few people, different people highlighted in it. Um, as your career progresses within the HSE as well, it's it's very important if that information is available for informal inquiries. It always helps to contact that person. Um, I have found in the past, even for myself, contacting someone just for a chat about the role and what to expect and current projects that they're involved in. Um, it really helped me sort of focus on you know what was expected within the role. And it also mentioned one or two things I was unaware of. Um, which I was able to sort of speak about in the interview in more depth. And it sort of gives, I suppose, the board a more of a, you know, a different perspective on you that you've done your research, that you're, you know, you're interested in the role. So if that option is available to you, I would, you know, I would take it. Um, it might be as at staff grade or just coming into the HSE, but definitely when you're going for senior posts or going for different roles and you have that, inf you have that contact available, I'd definitely be using it. Um, and that's the job spec for the main page of it. The next part that concerns you on that is the eligibility criteria. Um, now, the eligibility criteria basically sets out the requirements needed for the role. So things that you must have in order to be considered for interview and to be considered for the role. Um, again, we have um, our we've our podiatrist on the left this time and dietitian on the right. They're very, very similar in that all that is needed at this stage when you apply is that you be registered or eligible for registration on the podiatrist register or on the dietitian reg register. Um, and that means basically what I discussed with Koru, you either register with Koru or you're eligible for registration. So when you pass your course and you get your results, you are eligible for registration at that point. So you fall under that category. And the best thing about the national campaigns is they're geared for undergraduates who have not yet qualified. Um, there's two notes on the left hand side at the top and on the right hand one on the bottom, basically saying that for all 2024 undergraduates who are due to qualify this year um, will be considered for this post. So it's a thing that's added in there basically to safeguard your application. In other campaigns, if you you know, if you do, if you don't have registration or not eligible at this point, sometimes you may not be considered, but the national campaigns you will be considered for. And again, all other once you qualify as well, you'd be considered obviously for all positions as well. So it's a good point to note. And as you progress as well through the HSC and more requirements, you know, become available. And um, I suppose when you're working in a HSC as a staff grade profession, you usually have to have about three years. You have to have three years experience in order to be eligible for a senior position. And um, so it's always good to note that you know, at that point when you're on your eligibility criteria, it will have that, you know, you need three years experience within the discipline for the senior post. So they will develop as you work your way up through the system as well. Um, and there's just an extra point on that note about 2024 undergraduates. Um, and again, just the additional campaign information, I won't talk about it too much because it just has a lot of the information that I've said. It discusses panels a bit more, which I'll discuss later, and it'll also discuss, let's say, if visa requirements are an issue for anyone in attendance or, you know, any of your 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 mates. It will highlight, I suppose, the different areas or what's considered for a visa or where to go or where to apply, and it'll highlight a few different points as well for you. Um, so our application then, our application form. So our application form, you can see as well, I have our, our two put up here. They're very similar. You know, our your information, personal details will be entered on the first two page on the first page. Um, and then it will move on to, I suppose there is has been this year brought in about regional health areas in that you will interview once for you know, the national campaign. But what it asks for in your application form is that you will highlight, you know, the areas that you would like to work in or receive job offers from. And what happens here is you're allowed to select one, um, but you definitely, you know, you're allowed to select one, of course, but you're a, a maximum of two. 
So the way it works um, in the past, you were just brought on a whole overall national panel and you received job offers from everywhere. But what they've decided to do now is get you to pick at this stage the area you'd like to work in. Um, and it's always good to note that you can obviously pick one if that's your intention, but it's always good to add the second in just to receive the job offers, even if you've no intention of working in that area. Uh, things may change you know, over the next few months as well. So all is sort of broaden it and cast the net as wide as you can. And what this means essentially is let's say for the interviews itself, it's a competency based interview and um, you have to score at least 40 in each competency to pass. And once you pass all competencies, you're placed on a panel. And what they do is now the panel, no overall national panel will be divided into six, let's say panels. Um, so whichever areas you've selected. So if you selected HC West and Northwest and HSE Southwest, um, what will happen is if you score 400 in your interview, you may it's put in order of merit. So the highest score will be highest of the panel. You may effectively be second on the HSE West and Northwest, and you could be sixth on the HSE Southwest. Um, so you could have different sort of levels on it. But again, you're going to be the way the HSE works with job offers or expressions of interest. They will email, I suppose, everyone on the panel, let's say for HSE West and Northwest and say, look, this job has become available in Sligo University Hospital. You know, you have two days to express your interest. And then what happens is you express your interest if you want the job. If you don't, you just ignore the email. Um, and then whoever is highest in order of merit um, will be offered the job or will be moved on to pre-employment clearances. So you may effectively be seventh on a panel and think that oh, I'm seventh, you know, I'm a bit away from a job, but you might get a job offer out there, expression of interest, and the six people ahead of you may have effectively taken other jobs, been taken off the panel, they might want the job. So always express your interest if you're interested in the job at all. Um, and that's just basically it about these regional health areas. Um, it moves on then to your qualifications and eligibility. Again, we have the podiatrist on the right and dietitian on the left. And just ask for details about where you have got your course, got your qualification. And then the final part will be about post specific requirements. So on our table here that you can see, we've experienced relevant to the role. The first box obviously demonstrates your depth of breadth and dietetic services. The bottom one then is in relation to podiatry, depth and breadth of experience as relevant to the role. So this will come in a format. It'll allow you to enter at least it has to be a maximum of one page of information. So what you will do on that piece is basically fill out all your experience related to the area or your discipline. So work placements or whatever it may be and fill out as much as possible within that. All your experiences, you know, your assessments to date, your involvement within, I suppose, your work placements as well or whatever that you've done. Always just make sure to fill in as much information as you can on that piece. And um, that piece becomes more crucial as you work your way up within the HSC. Um, you have to basically when people when we're doing eligibility and discussing if a person is eligible or not, we can shortlist basically the level and the quality of applicants based on that section. And um, so obviously when you go further on, you have three years experience as a dietitian or podiatrist. We'd be looking at that experience for you to basically write down, you know, as much as you can, but, you know, relevant information um, because that could be the sort of benchmark between you getting an interview or not getting an interview. So it's always be very mindful of filling out that, you know, document clearly. And again, if you don't put something down on that section, we don't know that you've done it or that you're even aware of it. So if you're half thinking, well, is it relevant or is it not relevant? Put it, put it down um, and, you know, tie it up to the job or the post that's available there as well. Um, that's essentially the application um, part of it. We have our general declaration and we have our references there. Um, what I'm going to do quickly, we, we've run a, a survey. If you have your phones and just scan the QR code, um, what this is, is it's a survey that allows us to get your opinion. I suppose of what you're looking for within a role, um, not just agency related, but all roles. Um, and it allows us to sort of adopt new initiatives and look at different areas that we're able to, um, you know, try it, try and make a change within um, and try and bring in a few initiatives to to attract talent and attract graduates like yourselves. Um, what I'll do is after this in two minutes, I'm going to just give you just to fill that out if you can, because it is a, a great um, source of um, assistance and help for us. I'll give you two minutes to do that and then we're going to move on to the interview. Um, I'll discuss the interview and the competencies that are available. And again, Ruth and uh, Caroline will, I suppose, discuss the professional knowledge side of it um, of the interview and certain things that, you know, certain tips and pointers for you as well. Um, 
So if you can just fill that out, if any of you have questions at this point as well, you can just click on the chat function um, and enter your question. Um, and I'll just give just two minutes just to time to do the survey. Um, and if there's no questions, then we will move on, I suppose, and discuss the interview section. Yeah, so uh, Nikki has put up how long do you remain on the panel? So it's a very good question as well for the national panel. Basically, it's usually an operation for a year and a year will, you know, the vast majority of the time we'll see everyone come off the panel and go into jobs. Um, so that panel can last a year. Um, the HSC panels generally last, you know, a minimum of a year to a maximum of three years. But for the national campaign, it will be exhausted in terms that everyone will be brought off it and into work. Um, the important thing for you to note as well, I'm highlighting only the national campaign for you at the minute, but there is various different campaigns that will be live related to dietitian and related, related to podiatry all around the country that will come up um, on the HC website. And obviously you'll get notifications if you sign up to the Career Hub. So you can apply for whatever jobs, 10, 15 jobs that are available. Um, so it's not necessary just in case you're thinking all your eggs are in one basket for the national panel. That's not the case. Um, you can apply to as many of them as possible. This is only just sort of the undergraduate starting point that we'd advise everyone to join. But essentially just in the professions that you're in as well. I mean, that, that, you know, there is a large demand for people, you know, undergraduates like yourselves. So the reality is, you know, you will be on the panel and the panel will be in existence really as I, I imagine as long as there is people on it. So I think everyone will come off it within the year. Probably a lot quicker as well, I'd imagine. Um, that's perfect. Thanks for that, Nick. I hope that answers your question. Um, I'll move on then quickly to oh, we have another question in the application form. What date should you put in the box date of degree awarded? So you can say on it um, basically because these are catered that the recruitment managers are fully aware that you're not qualified at this point yet. Um, and what it works if you're due to graduate later in the year, the gradu graduation is sort of a separate you know, it's a separate ceremony. It's basically celebrating the results that you've got in May or June. So, you know, when someone asks the year that you've graduated or the times that you graduated, essentially you've graduated from that at the point that you get your results and that you've passed everything. So the best thing that you could do is on that, you could put to be confirmed on it and you could highlight in it, you know, mid, I don't know when you get your results. Is it mid, late May, early May or early June? You can just put down a rough time frame of when you expect, you know, that you're, your degree will be awarded to you essentially. So whenever they say that about the degree awarded, like our graduation, just talk about when you when you expect to qualify, when you expect your results to come through. The graduation usually takes place in October, even November in some places. So it's a good bit away. So just talk about when your results, when you expect to achieve, you know, your your full results. So just speak whatever last week in May. Some of you may even know the date at this point. So um just put down that information. Now, oh, thank you very much. So we move on. We'll discuss, I suppose, the interview side of it. Um, again, the career hub I've referenced as well a couple of points on. We have modules here about interviews, how they're assessed and how to prepare for an interview. And um, there's very good information there in your prep work as well. Um, and what I'll do, so I'll show you the crossover between dietitians and podiatrists. And um, what you see here on this page is so you'll be called for interview after you're eligible. You'll be moved on the interview board or the recruitment managers looking after the campaign will invite you to interview. And on that email, you will receive all the information about duration of the interview, the interview board, who's going to be interviewing you. And also they're going to highlight the competencies that you're going to be interviewed on. So you will know, I'll show you now exactly what the competencies are going to be. And you're able to tell that off your job spec, but a lot of people are unaware of that fact until they get called to interview. So when you're called to interview, they'll further highlight these areas that the competencies are that you're going to be assessed on. Um, on your job spec, specifically first for dietitians, um, there is a section called um, skills, competencies and other knowledge on the job spec that's currently live and it highlights them in the format that you can see here. Um, the areas in bold are your competency areas for, in, for interview. So with professional knowledge, plan and management resources, team player skills, commitment to provide a quality service, evaluate information and communication and interpersonal skills. And all these bullet points within are basically what you should know going into the position um, or what sort of is expected for you to know. Not everyone is going to know them. I think there's 
could be people that are a year or two in the profession as well that isn't going to know everything but it just sort of familiarizes with you know generally you know the vast majority of information you should know and um, again do with your to do with the podiatrist side of it this was the one that was used last year so there was no competencies in bold and um, it didn't highlight them you know as as well as it had previously here on these slides but i just highlighted a few of the points it essentially is the same competencies so we have our not every time i've highlighted knowledge obviously that's professional knowledge we plan and organizing skills which relates to your planning and managing resources with your team player skills, communication, interpersonal skills, and it's the same competencies for both that will be considered. Um, and the table here that I have is, this is what the interview board will assess you on. Um, so we have planning and managing resources, team skills, commitment to provide a quality service, and knowledge and experience relevant to the role. So we have four competencies you are going to be directly questioned on. The bottom two then is evaluate information and judging situations and communication and interpersonal skills. Um, what these are is they're globally assessed competencies, which means you're not going to get any direct questions on these. What happens is the board will assess you in the top four and they will take certain points and certain things that you've said along the way and they will score you on the bottom two. So in all your preparation, when you're creating examples and you're doing a bit of <coughs> prep work for your interviews, always be aware of the globally assessed competencies because you will be scored on them um, without actually direct question on them. So you can incorporate them into your answers. Um, a lot of communication and interpersonal skills obviously is, is massive in any role, not just with the HSC, but a lot of your interactions on a daily basis, like when you're assessing, when you're face to face with a patient, your colleagues, a lot of the examples you give without even realizing it's all communication and interpersonal skills. So that will be included and just try and reference it, you know, as, as you know, as frequently as possible that, you know, communication into personal skills obviously is essential within any, any role. And you can tie that into evaluating information and judging situations. Again, this will be emailed to you on the day. Make sure when the email comes through that you are when you're called to interview, make sure that you double check and confirm that the competencies you know you will see them and just make sure that they are the same as this and um, it has been the same for the last number of years um, and just on the off chance that they decide to you know make team skills or commitment to fight a quality service they might swap one or two of them but generally for the last few years they've stayed the same but i just want to further highlight just double check and triple check when you get that email that the competencies are the same and if not, the information is still the same. One will be globally assessed and there'll be more focus in the interview on the other one. So just be, be extra conscious of that as well. And um, what, what I had done, I suppose, in offering, I suppose, an extra bit of tips or pointers is um, there's the star technique that you can use um, when you're creating examples um, of your, I suppose, your experience or in work placement or whatever it may be. And it's situation, task, action and result. And particularly like let's for the and in a manager resources or team skills like um you know describe the situation um that you that you were in um obviously to do with team skills and it incorporates you i suppose needing to focus on i suppose your colleagues and what they were doing what you were doing personally yourself you can describe the situation maybe you're under pressure or had to prioritize a certain patient let's say over another patient because of urgency um, and then you can describe the task about the challenges constraints deadlines and then you move on to your action how the team worked together what you had to do who decided it had you a meeting did you deal with um fellow dietitians fellow podiatrists was there other uh, disciplines involved was there occupational therapy let's say for example or physios or different elements of it involved bring as much into into the example as possible and then your overall result <clears throat> and in specifically when you're talking about team player skills and being part of a team and how you came together to overcome a challenge always reference yourself as well you know say you know i took part in this or this was you know my responsibility within the team and um, it also allows the board to fully know that you understand the question as well um, and always um you know it doesn't have to essentially be a massive um you know organizational change that has taken place the board just want to know that you understand the example you don't have to go for the extravagant or you don't have to go for you know different elements of it and um, what the board generally do as well it's a good point to note in your interview that the board they won't essentially interrupt you you may be discussing something for two or three minutes they may say oh that's great can you actually talk a bit more about this specific point and um, never be too put 
you know, taken aback by what the board says. The board are either have got enough off you in your example and they're trying to get you more points or that they're just trying to regain your focus to a particular area. Uh, the board wants, you know, we need everyone to pass the interview and we want everyone to pass the interview. So the board's job is to get you across the line. So always just be conscious that no one is trying to trip you up or essentially, you know, put you under any significant pressure. We need you, we, you know, we need you in these positions. And um, so always just be conscious that is generally how the board approach it. They may try to redirect you or steer you to a particular area. And that may be because, you know, you're doing exceptionally well and they want to get the best out of you or that you maybe have gone a small bit off, talk, to off topic and they're trying to regain your focus on it as well. And um, again, I suppose for the professional knowledge side of it, I'm just going to bring Ruth um, and Caroline back into it as well. I might just touch base with Ruth first um, just to see, just to have she any advice or wisdom, I suppose, on the professional knowledge side of it. How are you going, Ruth? Hi. Um, one second, I'll just, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at the screen is a bit off. There we go. Now, um, hi. So, yeah. So, so from a point of view of the the professional knowledge, just, um, it's, it's, it's some advice about this bit, I suppose, is that this bit as an entry level dietitian should be really the confidence that you are most comfortable with, because this is the real core professional competence and practice around dietetic care and so from that perspective and um, it's dedicated to testing and ex exploring the actual your competence as an entry level dietitian and so having gone through clinical placement and having gone through the core aspects of nutritional care assessment and care planning, implementation and review of the plan, that is always going to be the core of your nutrition, of your knowledge and knowledge and experience for entry level. And so when you're developing up your examples of professional knowledge um, relevant to the role, um, always kind of put your example within a very, you know, a well-known kind of commonplace nutritional assessment approach to any kind of population type. So I always think rather than kind of get distracted over well, what, what if they ask me about this example or that example of kind of very specific niche things, if you focus very specifically on how do I go about a nutritional assessment how do I, um, you know, how, how do I go through things like anthropometry, your biochemistry, down then through your clinical um, exam of the patient and into your dietary history? If you get those kind of core competencies nailed down in your example and you include then within those competencies, within that example, if you include then the how you do, how you do that, so how you do the nutritional assessment and what kind of references are you using so what kind of equations will be you be using to calculate energy requirements for example um, and why you're using those exam why you're using that method and um, as you write your example to start thinking about those and i suppose when you've written your basic example go back over that section there of professional knowledge and experience and what you'll see there is those core points around you have the knowledge to carry out the duties, which is around nutritional care of the patient. You 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 do know the different models, and you're making a decision. And 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 this brings in you know something that Connor mentioned there around evaluating and judging situations. Always consider when you're doing your professional knowledge. Consider there. Um, you know, making a judgment. I thought about the options that were available to me. And I made a decision to proceed with this option. So having that as a, as a pivotal mark within when you're describing your professional knowledge in an example, I, I, I thought about the options. And I went with this particular one because and I thought it was the right one because of this reason. So that will allow the, the inter board, interview board to assess not just your professional knowledge and experience, but also your you evaluate the situation and you made judgment and you followed through and you reviewed. So so incorporating that decision moment in your example is very important to cover both competencies. And um, we'd always think it's very important in this to have a good knowledge of the environmental and policy aspects of care. And in particular, if you're doing um, an, an entry level um, interview for an acute setting that you're very well familiar with and um, the um, 
clinical guideline number 22 on malnutrition uh, screening and identification of malnutrition in acute care and the steps that are taken to manage that. Um, and that you call that out in your example as, as a policy that will guide you. And um, also that you have um, that you will be familiar as well with um, discharge and transfer of care um, in either, you know, no matter what setting that you're actually you're interviewing for, that you're, you, you're demonstrating that professional knowledge and um, steps towards discharge how care is integrated across boundaries um, and you're giving in your example and uh, like, you know you're finishing your example with how you passed on that patient to another caregiver or how you discharge that patient safely and effectively and that's my last point really is if you you know if we focus on professional knowledge and experience what the team will want to, or what the interview board will want to know is that you are able to provide safe care that's efficient and that it's effective so always go back over your example and always be clear that safety is number one and then it's effective and it's efficient and that, you know, they're they're what you're trying to demonstrate through your example. Is that is that helpful, Connor? Oh, that's very good, Ruth. Thanks so much for that. Thanks so much. And um, I will invite, I suppose, Caroline in now as well. You're on mute there, Caroline, I think. Sorry. To go too um, far. <laughs> yeah, just to echo Ruth and what Connor um has been saying there. I suppose it is your interview, and the big thing that we want to see from a pediatry point of view is what have you done? So it shouldn't be about we, it's your interview. So take the time to do that. Be confident in um your answers, but also, you know, we're not there on the interview board to try to trick you. So if there's anything that's unclear or hasn't been worded, take a breath and don't be afraid to say, look, could you reword that for me as well? I think um, Connor touched on it earlier um, from a podiatry point of view, having those informal inquiries, contacts. Don't be afraid to contact any of us. Um, I actually be surprised how little people use this, but it is a key resource for you to get a better insight into the area, to hear what is happening on the ground um, from the podiatry manager, and you'll get a wee bit of guidance in order to go into that interview. When you're in the interview, what I would say is have a structure. So um, sometimes when you're asked to talk about a podiatry assessment, we all start in the middle, but think about your SOAP format. You're talking about meeting the patient, asking the patient how they are, getting consent. So have that structure that you would do in your full assessment, <clears throat> okay? So think about the patient and the process that you go in. Just don't dive in and start talking about neurological and vascular. We want to hear everything from you take the patient from the waiting room. Also, in relation to that is know and reference your policies, your HSE policies, national policies like the model of care, um, for the Diabetic Foot 2021 and justify why you've done X, Y and Z. Also within podiatry, we have had a big change with the introductions of the enhanced community care programmes. So know the difference between the community health networks and the chronic disease management hubs and what podiatrists would do in each one of those. OK, so have a working knowledge of what's happening in the HSE. Um, have an interest in the area that you're going in. And I suppose, um, as Ruth says, what we're also trying to see, you are a staff grade pediatrist coming in. We're not expecting you to know absolutely everything, but we want to know that you're practicing safely. So what would you do if you weren't um, sure of doing something? Where would you go um, and what would you look up? So it's seeing that you're going to be safe in practice. Um, and I think one of the big things is have a mock interview with the family and friends. So write down a few questions, see how you come across an interview that you're not getting tongue tied or if there's a question or anything that puts you off. Um, so don't be afraid to take time out and actually role play through that interview process. That's us. That's great. Thanks so much, Caroline, for that. Um, it's always good to get good insight into, I suppose, um, from the other side, the board, the board side and what they'll be expecting. Um, Caroline and Ruth, thanks so much for today. I, I'm sure you're fairly busy, so you can, um, you know, you can, you can head off um, whenever. 
whenever that you like. Um, thanks for, I suppose, everything and the words of wisdom and advice that you've given. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I have a few minutes left to conduct uh, this. So thanks a million and I'll talk to you both again soon. Thank you. Best of luck, everyone. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you. Um, so it is, it's always good to get the insight, I suppose, from the two professionals and what they sort of would expect. Um, I suppose those are the interview competencies that we have, you know, available on the screen there. At this point, you know, you are going to be, they are your competencies you're going to be interviewed on. It's always good to write them down. And those of you that are still doing placements or have just done placements, you can take the time between now and when you're called to interview to actually think of these examples. And, you know, you may just be doing conducting day to day duties might be related to work and it may come into your head going, Do you know what, that was a good example of this and write that down. Um, and again, it's always good to talk it out. The mock interview thing is a very good idea. Um, also, just talking out loud, being in a setting if you're driving or something and just going over the examples just so that you're confident enough in speaking out loud. I found that very effective that, you know, just get used to the sound of your own voice um, of, of talking out loud and describing various things. Um, and the interview, you know, it will go well for you um, once you do a bit of the prep work in it. And again, we're not trying to, you know, look for the most complicated examples and trip everyone up. We just want to see as as our two guest speakers have said that, you know, you do practice safely, efficiently, and that a lot of, you know, that the work we're only expecting you to have that sort of ground knowledge or that foundation set. So it's good for us to know that that's, you know, you have that set and that you're ready, I suppose, to join us within, I suppose, the clinical setting or acute setting or whatever it may be. Um, again, um, the Career Hub has sort of interview sample questions. Now, these aren't just for staff grade, they're for everyone. Um, and they have, you know, different ones like plan and organize an example of a situation. You directly respond to plan and imagine something that might be as effective in this one. But there is certain ones like um, for our next week's team player and commitment to provide a quality service, just general ones that might give you, I suppose, a bit of food for thought. You know, give me an example of when you worked as a team to achieve a specific objective. There may be times like a question of when, you know, someone on the team, you know, might not have been working effectively as, you, as you know, as the rest of the team and how that was dealt with as part of a team. You know, the communication involved in it, you'd sit the person down, you discuss what was expected. You know, you all pulled together, you all had assigned your own tasks and you met regularly to make sure that you were achieving them tasks. Just, a, you know, along those lines, it'll give you an extra sort of an area to discuss. And as I said, they're all available on Career Hub for you to revert back to um, there's post reflection tools as well there um, the panel then I've discussed the panel you know at various stages throughout um, <clears throat> so the, the terms that you should be sort of familiar with with these are expressions of interest order merit and recommendation for post or recommendation to proceed and um, basically as I said earlier you are rated competency you have to score over 40 they're marked out of 100 and once you secure all of them you will be placed on a panel and then once you're active when you register with Coru, they'll start expressing the posts out and basically they don't offer it to the top person on the panel whoever number one is they will express the job out to everyone on the panel so it could be expressed to 20 people and what they do is then they will go to you know whoever is highest in order of merit and um, they will get the job and it may work for a case if you delay with Koru um, let's say if there's 10 people on the panel that are still waiting on Koru and number seven does it you know the quickest and gets registered the quickest on it uh, and is made active on the panel it may be a case that you know number seven may be the first person on the panel that's active so it, that sort of highlights the necessity for registration with Koru as well so just be mindful of that uh, the recommendation for post or recommendation to proceed means if you're highest in order of merit, your next correspondence with the HC will be, you know, congratulations. We uh, have a recommendation to proceed with the post for yourself because you've expressed interest and then it'll move on to pre-employment clearances. And um, so they're just the points that you need to know on that. Um, there's certain panel management rules about time spans, expressions of interest. They'll all be highlighted in your email. Um, a lot of the times you're given two or three days to express your interest. After that, then they just they just cut it off and then they'll go to whoever, you know, express interest highest in order of merit. Um, and then you move on to your pre-employment clearances. And again, the HSC, I think Ruth had said that she'd, you know, applied for a job nearly and got it the following Monday. Those times don't really exist anymore. Uh, there's a lot of registration, obviously, with core, there's a delay. And then once you move on to pre-employment clearances, they go on to OCH health checks, they go on to guard of vetting if needed, they go on to obviously discuss your salary. And um, just for yourself starting your salary scale, 
you would be starting on the staff grade point one on the scale. Um, there's no negotiations, I suppose, within the HSC. Uh, you know, when you're moving up the scale, what happens is you join it at the staff grade level one. All the salary scales are available online. Um, and then every year on the date that you start your job, if you start today, the 9th of April 2024, on the 9th of April 2025, you're automatically go up in increments. So your wages will increase. And that just works continuously uh, throughout, I suppose. I think each might have nine or 12 points on the scale. So you'll move up every year until you reach the peak of your discipline. And then after that, you will obviously, if you go for promotion, you will move on to a different pay scale altogether and you'll work continuously up through that as well. So there are good points to note. But again, there's areas here, OCHEL Oc Oc checks, guard of vetting, salary contract with reference and qualifications check those things take time also as well and um, so it's not just a case you'll start monday these could take you know four or five weeks effectively and um, so always just consider when you're expressing an interest it doesn't mean that right someone's going to contact you and say where are you can you start tomorrow it's a case of we have to go through these motions and they have to they have to confirm a start date with you, you know, in the early stages. So once it comes on, if your panel expression of interest recommendation to proceed, you accept the offer, you do your pre-employment checks. At that stage, then your contract is drawn up. Your line manager, whoever you're going to be supervised by, will put down your start date. And that will be a conversation that they'll have with you. They may want you to start on the 1st of September. You may say, do you know what, you know, the 14th of September really probably does suit me. I'll float that idea. So you can go back and say, look, that date suits me. What do you think? They may say, oh, yeah, that's OK. They may say, no, we sort of need you on the first. Then that's a decision you have to make then at that stage. Um, but just be mindful of that as well. Um, and the whole process can take, I suppose, between five and eight weeks um, to go from, let's say, the recommendation to proceed. The expression of interest on that you actually start the job can take, you know, a month or, you know, a couple of weeks longer. In some parts of the service that there's a massive urgency, they will push things through a lot quicker, but you will be informed of that very, very early on as well. Uh, but you will be given, you know, advance notice of when you're going to start. So you'll still, you know, have your few weeks, you know, during the summer, you'll still have holidays, you'll still have time to obviously wind down, but uh, you will be aware of this information. There's a few steps there on what to, I suppose, expect along the journey. Um, and then that essentially is everything from um, our webinar today. Um, we've a good bit of time, obviously, to spare on it. Um, there's a feedback survey then about our webinar. If you want to, I'd same principle as the last time, just scan that and that'll help inform us on our future approaches to webinars. Um, we're very interested in hearing what people think of the content. Would they like more information on specific areas? Would they like less on specific areas? Um, I think the way we have it done is just to highlight or create awareness about the national campaigns and give you extra advice and wisdom on, um, I suppose, the interview and how to prep for them. The HSE interviews are unlike others, they're competency based, they follow a structure, a point and a grading system. We follow the same principles so that every campaign is the same. So, you know, we have the same advertising um, deadlines, we have the same, you know, eligibility interview, we have the same across all disciplines. So whether you're going for a staff grade dietitian or you're going for, you know, the most senior post within the HSE, it follows the exact same pattern. It's all competency based, it's the same structure. So that's why um, it's always important to note that. Um, I suppose at this point, I'll uh, give you a chance, I suppose, for a couple of minutes if you want to enter some questions into the chat function. Um, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to put in um, my sort of general email that I monitor as well. Um, this is. This will allow you, I suppose, if you wish to, if any questions come up in the next couple of days that you're concerned about or that you didn't think about on the webinar, just drop me. Um, an email on to that email. Uh, obviously, my name is Connor, so just, you know, address it to myself and I'll be able to address your query as quickly as possible. Um, so you can put in whatever, you know, whatever questions you have about panels or questions that you may have about the interview itself or the structure of it. Uh, the interviews can be fairly, you know, they're fairly quick, four or five minutes each competency. So, you know, time moves fa fast, quick enough. So is site specific whether you'll be able to start a post as a dietic assistant while waiting for core registration? So the way that that works, especially with, I suppose with, with the dietic assistants and the therapy assistant roles, they can work off a different format that they may decide with the national campaign that, right, there might be enough people, you know, registered at a certain point and they may have a vacancy within that. So they may offer a post out for an assistant role off that panel um, at, at, at any stage. And they may, you know, 
you may have to, they may invite you obviously to work a lot quicker. You don't need your registration to work as the assistant. And then what they may do then is when you are get your registration, they'll transfer you over to, you know, to the to the full staff grade dietitian. So then positions can become available within it. The best thing to do um, at them points is when you have your when you place on the panel essentially and when your interview is done and you're waiting for certain things it's no harm in dealing with the person that is emailing you um, about your details about your interview and about all these different areas they will be managing the panel also so it's definitely worth posing that question to them um, is there a dietic assistant you know roles that are available and um, i know from phys certain physiotherapy and ot as well that you know they have pulled you know assistance off that while they're waiting for core registration so it's definitely it's not something that happens the whole time but it does happen frequently you know across all disciplines so definitely contact them once you panel and, and pose that question to them as well <laughs> because they'll have more up-to-date information about what they have in front of them i don't know if they might have two three four or five no roles like that straight away so it's definitely worth <clears throat> asking whoever's dealing with your panel who's who's emailing you um, ask them that question. I hope that answers that for you. Have we any other questions? I'll just give it another minute or two and then we will <coughs> It's your, I suppose, time. If you have anything, uh, you know, that you're concerned about at all, or even anything at all, you, you can ask the question. Um, if I can't answer it, I can I get, get you a response and come back to you this afternoon. So don't be um, don't be shy on this platform to ask the questions. Again, that is the email. Um, that's our generic email that I, I, I monitor and I'm on every day as well. So at any stage during the process at all, if you have any questions, um, please let me know. That's perfect. Well, look, we will leave it at that. So uh, thanks very much, everyone, for attending today. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your interview and the best of luck in, in the whole process. Um, and you can, um, no problem. Thanks so much. Um, we will talk to you soon. Please contact me if you have any questions. And look, the very best of luck with everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today and for filling out the service.